Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the first ever West Coast edition of the Good Food Festival and Conference here in Santa Monica. We're very excited. I'd like to introduce to you right now the mayor of the city of Santa Monica, Richard Bloom, and the supervisor of the Santa Monica Farmers Markets, Laura Avery. Please give them a huge hand. <laughs> I've been upstaged by Wagner and Stanton McDonald Wright. Welcome to Barnum Hall, Santa, Monica's, uh, Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District's historic Barnum Hall. It's great to see you all here this evening for this great program that, uh, that we're going to have tonight. How about a round of applause for the Good Food Festival? Festival. And conference. I almost didn't get that out. And conference, right? It's a mouthful. As you know, it started yesterday. It goes through the weekend. There are tons of great events, and I'm sure you're going to be out at a number of them. I would like to introduce to you now the doyen of the farmer's markets. Ladies and gentlemen, no, no, no. Is it true or not true? We would not have Santa Monica farmer's markets if it were not for Laura Avery. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bloom. This is such an, such an honor and such a thrill. And you know, and I wouldn't have been doing this for 29 years if I hadn't had the complete unfailing support of the city of Santa Monica through all of our growth and trials and everything that we have to do to keep the farmer's market strong and true for the farmers. And basically, it's a pretty simple philosophy. If you do what's good for farmers, everything is going to be OK. The farmers are going to do well. They're going to bring more food. Customers are going to come. Farmers will keep coming. On rainy days, they'll come anyway. So it's been a terrific, fabulous 30 years, and I've been very happy to be part of it for 29. And so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to have some wonderful speakers we've brought in for the Good Food Festival and Conference, not just from the city of Santa Monica itself, but also thought leaders from around the good food world. There are so many things going on in the good food movement today. You can't pick up a newspaper. You can't hear about food safety or childhood diabetes or health crisis or soaring health costs for diet-related illnesses that can be cured or prevented from happening at all by having good, fresh, locally grown, sustainable food, by supporting a food system and by supporting farmers who grow food because they love to grow and they love to have people enjoy what they grow. And that's what the farmers markets have really brought to the farmers, the customers, the chefs, and now these wonderful produce companies that are coming in and we're helping the farmers to grow and we're helping them to increase their capacity and we couldn't have a better place, a more dramatic opening for this wonderful event. And I hadn't seen this ever. And Mayor, you had never, have you ever seen this before? This is fabulous. And uh, it is a, a uh, abstract depiction of the Valkyrie entering Valhalla, which is why we had to play the Wagner. So it's all art. It's art for the brain, art for the stomach. It's food, it's art, it's, it's all together. And we're just so happy to be celebrating tonight. And thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoyed the, the art gallery as well. That's really been fun to put together. So now I want to introduce a woman who needs no introduction, Evan Kleiman, who Very supportive. I think she's busier than all of us put together, and here she is tonight, and she's been so helpful for all of our planning. We went and met her. She met Jim Slama, and we went to her house. We said, Evan, we need you to be our, we need you to tell us what to do and how to make this all be good for the chefs. And so Evan's been a terrific source of, don't do this, do this, don't do this, and it's great. So Evan, 
I'm going to have you come up and uh, introduce our panel. And Evan Kleiman, Good Food, KCRW, how many years? Are we almost since 1998? Okay, well, since 1998, you do the math. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And uh, fun, always fun to have around. And thank you so much for coming tonight. Well, thank Evan. you, Laura. Again, Congratulations. Again. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. This is such a great night. We're here to celebrate the Santa Monica Farmers Market's 30th anniversary. Such a pleasure. And uh, the celebration is the perfect kickoff to the days ahead of conversation and sharing about food. Well, because the market has everything, it has farmers bringing food eaters and chefs. It's fun for all ages, as they say. And uh, I really believe that its existence is ground zero for a larger conversation about our food system. Um, but more than anything, it gives all of us so much pleasure. So let's bring up, I think, a really great panel of people whose lives I know are entwined with the market on a daily basis. Um, Suzanne? Suzanne Goen is chef and restaurateur, Luke AOC Tavern, Hungry Cat, and of course she's a recipient of James Beard Award. Thank Welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna say uh, the doyen. The doyen. <laughs> um, Mark Peel, chef owner of Campanile <laughs> and Carpet. Also a James Beard Award winner. Amelia Saltzman. Amelia has done so much for the market. She's a writer, cooking teacher, author of the award-winning book, The Farmer's Market Cookbook, Simple Foods, Seasonal Recipes, and Stories from the Market and Farm. And Alex Weiser, one of our stalwart farmers. So I don't really feel like standing up here being far away from all of you, so I'm going to come sit next to you. And um, meanwhile, I'd like each of you, let's start with Suzanne. Um, tell us your story, um, your history with the market, how long you've been coming, what made you come for the first time. Yes, uh, I... Uh, grew up in Los Angeles in an era when um, we didn't have, the farmer's market was basically at 3rd and Fairfax and you would go there and they had really good donuts and pies <laughs> and some fruit that I think was not actually grown by Washington. farmers. It was like from Washington and other places. And, um, but I, uh, my, I grew up in a family of uh, food lovers. My parents were obsessed with, um, with food and cooking and restaurants and I got exposed to a lot of great things as a child and um, ended up uh, cooking at a ma maison when I was uh, 17 for a couple of, actually a couple of weeks as an internship and I ended up staying through the summer. I went back east and um, worked at a place called Al Forno in Providence where actually, oddly enough, was the first time I was kind of exposed to that farm to table um, thing, which was, um, we used to go down in the summer, we would drive 45 minutes to a little town called Little Compton uh, just to get tomatoes, which seemed like a crazy thing to do, but we would do it and the tomatoes were amazing. Um, that kind of inspired me, I think, to get interested in Chez Panisse, and I got all the books and cooked everything, and I ended up uh, getting a job there and working there for two years, which is sort of like farm-to-table uh, grad school. <laughs> so we would, um, we, actually at the time, we didn't go to farmer's markets. We um, had worked with a farmer, and he grew whatever he grew, and we would go up and pick it up three times a week and come back and figure out what to cook with it. So um, I worked there for two years and sort of that changed my life and that became the way that I wanted to cook and I couldn't really cook any, any other way. Um, I, I, it sort of became odd to me to realize that people call up produce companies and order whatever they sort of fantasize about and make food with it. It's just not the way I've really ever done it. So I spent some time traveling around and came back and uh, actually went to go work for Mark and Nancy at the time with Campanile. And I remember um, 17 years ago getting into that white truck and driving to the farmer's market and I didn't really know what I was getting into. And uh, Paul and uh, Jack were there. And uh, you know, just showing up at this market and being just blown away by the variety of produce. The, you know, the, the farmers were there at a stand selling things that they had grown from all around. And, um, and we cooked that way at Campanile, and that just, that really just changed, you know, that kind of solidified for me that LA was the place where I wanted to stay. It was home, but it made me feel like I could actually really cook here. 
and probably, have, I mean, I had access to better things and more things than I really had in the Bay Area, which at the time was like, you just did not say that about, you know, dreaded Los Angeles. We were like the devils, and, and, and we, but actually we had it all figured out and they didn't know it, so uh, that's sort of been my experience. 17 years of, of shopping there, uh, 13 years ago, opened my own place, and um, we, I know, 13 years ago, huh? September 25th. Whoa. So, um, yes, the market is, that's, that's how we shop and cook and how we do what we do. Mm. Is that Mark. too long? Yeah, no, it's okay. perfect. Mark, hmm? um, of, of all of us in the city, I think of you as being like one of the first to start to go in a, in a, to the market in a really uh, committed way weekly. Tell us your, your history with it. Um, well, I don't come from the culinary background that uh, Suzanne does. My parents were teachers, and we grew up cooking whatever my mother found in the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, and that was it. <laughs> um, I had uh, my first job ever in a restaurant washing dishes because I had a girlfriend and no money. <laughs> Didn't work out so well, so I took the first job I could find, which was washing dishes, uh, in a small restaurant in Healdsburg, because we lived in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County at the time. And at that time, it was actually kind of a revelation. I saw sweetbreads, I saw all kinds of different things, a whole prime rib, a little bit of good produce at that time. That was the early 70s, but not so much. Then after that, for a few years, I went to college. And since I had a very minuscule background in food preparation, having washed dishes in a small restaurant, I worked my <laughs> way through college, cooking at a coffee shop, at a steakhouse, this or that. And after a while, I realized that I had enjoyed it and moved to Los Angeles because there was a program in hotel and restaurant management. And then at the same time, through a rather odd connection, through my mother, who worked for an optometrist, who had a patient, who was the husband of Lois Dwan. Um, I, Lois Dwan of the Dwan, Los who, Angeles Times. Los Angeles Times restaurant critic. I ended up as an apprentice at Ma Maison oh. under Wolfgang Puck. Hmm. And that was when it was um, an eye-opening experience, Again, but not a farmer's market at the time. But Wolfgang had come from Europe, uh, Austria and France, and he had a higher expectation of what was, what was possible. And he made demands to the produce company, and we started getting better and better and better things. Um, then I went on to, to France, where I saw that they would not necessarily just go to the farmer's market. They would, the chefs would go to farmer's market, but they would get farmers to deliver directly to them, and the quality of the produce that was available was so far and above what we could get in Los Angeles, but yet it raised the bar. He said, this is not, you know, what we could get, that was not the penultimate. We could do better. And then when, when I came back, and then I went to Michael's, and then on to Chez Panisse, the, I could see the produce getting better and better and better. And then um, going to Italy and going to a lot of farmers markets there and seeing the connection between the restaurants, the small restaurants and households and the farmers, what's available right there in front of you, I, I knew that it was possible. When it came, then we came back and finally we opened Campanile and there was a connection. Um, you know, we didn't have a part in opening the Santa Monica Farmers Market. We latched on quite a bit later. Uh, we've only been going there, what, 17, 18 years. So, but <clears throat> I think that we were there in the beginning, I, I think, of the explosion of it. Because they, as soon as this conversation starts between chefs, people who love food, and the farmers, directly with the farmers, without the filtering mechanism of produce companies and brokers and so on, it gets really fun. <laughs> you can go back and say, now what about this seed? And I had a conversation with someone today, actually. Uh, somebody from Los Angeles Magazine, I forget his name, and I think that I blamed you for Cabo Nero. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be accurate. Um, I think the story is that you brought seed back for Cabo Nero. You, you were the first one. I, 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 I brought... I, Cavalunero, Agretti, yes. which we had for a while and then we lost, sadly, yes. and, and, and the amazing but, tomato. But I mean, the, but Cavalunero has really taken off. It's so you food. have that connection. You can go get seed from Italy. You say, I found this. I can get this. You want to grow this? Okay, we'll try it once. Whatever. And sometimes, not always, sometimes it'll take off. 
it'll, it'll be a revelation. And that's the way things grow, grow through fits and starts, uh, back and forth, that, communi that direct communication between people who love food, cook food, and people who grow food. And I think it's that connection, that spark, that has enabled the Santa Monica farmer's market especially to explode. That and, you know, confluence of events. Um, it is blessed by being on Wednesday, in my opinion. Absolutely. Why? Because that's the beginning of the weekend. When do mo restaurants do most of their business? Weekends. Wednesday is the perfect day. Amelia, you have a different perspective because you came, you came to the market as a mom and a, a person who was shopping to feed family. And then you, you fell in. I did. I, and, and actually, I've been shopping at the farmer's market longer than all of you. <laughs> well, I might be the oldest anyway. But um, I've been shopping uh, at the market for 26 years since we moved to the neighborhood. And I, I realized, listening to what, what both of you have said already, and as this time of reflection has been upon us, that I have always, even as a child, loved farmer's markets didn't find them in Los Angeles other than at Third and Fairfax, which I loved perfectly well in the 1950s. <laughs> um, but I was always drawn to them as a sense of giving me a sense of place, an understanding of where I was. And I have absolute memories of travel, visiting you know, my, my grandparents you know, in other countries. Um, and so that's, that's where it always started for me. And I was always um, I was always seeking something delicious. And so I just, that's where, it, that's where it started. I mean, I just started shopping and I fell in love. And it became, it became a complete community. I mean, the first thing that happened was, not only was I finding extraordinary tasting things, but I was meeting the people, I was finding community. I learned about myself that I am, I really am all about family, but in a broader sense as well. So I really felt that I had come home when I started at the market. And it evolved into a desire to, to share the experience and to chronicle. And I started, my relationship turned into, into that of a teacher and a writer. And um, the first story that I wrote for the LA Times was a story um, about going to the market with my dad as we waited for Blenheim apricots to show up. <laughs> and it ran on Father's Day, and it was, it was really an important moment, um, and, and it still to this day really reflects how I feel about the market every day. And that also was in 1998. And it's interesting to think that 1998, that's 13 years ago, and, and that is sort of part of the time of explosion, right, of all of this, Suzanne, that's when you started your restaurant. Um, and sometimes that seems like a really long time. And on the other hand, it says, really? We were only writing about this stuff 13 years ago in this way? Um, and that story really embodied what I continue to do and how I regard the market, which is, um, it was a story about family, it was a story about food memory, it was a story about a particular crop, an old variety. It was, it was about a lot of things coming together, a lot of layering, if you will, um, and that every single time I go to the farmer's market, and I get chills when I say this, but every time I go, and I know it's true for all of us, it resonates in that way. And um, so my relationship became, I, I became like a mission. Many of my stories were about, that I started writing as a freelancer, about farmers, about what they grew, about how they grew it, about how they worked with their family. In fact, I wrote the first cover story on the, for the food section, LA Times, about Alex Weiser and his potatoes. And that was only like, I don't know, 10, 11 ten years, years ago. Yes. 10 years ago. Yes. So it's really not a long time that 
that that has been happening at any rate. Um, so as a chronicler, and, and from all of that, passion really became a desire to, to share the experience. Um, whether I'm standing next to you, you know, shoulder to shoulder, buying, you know, a tomato, or whether it's teaching a class or writing a story. And really, that's how the book that I wrote evolved. I, I really did believe that the Santa Monica Farmer's Market had a very big story to tell. It really is a universal tale and, um, and, and really is an extraordinary message. So, and now um, I feel like I've become an advocate for small farmers, small family farmers, and good, clean food, and working at it at the state level. So it's, that's my personal journey. Alex, who asked your family to come to the market? Well, and how long ago was it? It was, uh, I remember the evening, it was, it was around dinner time, I think we were getting ready for dinner, we got a, a, no a knock on our double wide mobile home on, on the ranch. Um, and it was a gentleman named Vance Corum who, who was working with the state and Jerry Brown. And he knew my dad from, from the water board or, or some, from being active in the Farm Bureau or something. And he said, Sid, I don't know if you know about these farmers markets starting up, but you should send your sons to these markets. It's a, it'll be a great opportunity. And it was about the time I was starting, thinking of starting college, not thinking of starting college, about to start college, was, there was no doubt. But uh, my mom and dad thought it would be a good, a good way to pay for college was me to sell the, <laughs> the apples instead of giving me cash, work for it. So, um, so that's what I started doing. My brother and I started going to farmer's markets and helping out the family farm. Uh, and this was in, in 1981 where we, we've been, we had been farming for four years. We started in 1977 and we, we were losing a lot of money and in fear of going broke because we really, the only way you knew how to sell your, the only way to sell your crops was through conventional means, through brokers and downtown uh, agents that wanted, your, your apples were always not red enough or too late in the season and often we were packing out crops that were getting, <coughs> we were losing money on every box, losing a dollar a box. There were, so it was not the dream my parents thought it was going to be, but then came the farmer's markets which just changed everything and I was coming back with actually getting paid that day, cash to pay bills and, and the feedback from the people about it, it tastes good, that, that's what they wanted, it was food that taste, tasted great. And that's what we wanted to do, is produce, just give people tasty, healthy, good food. And it's, it was, it was an eye-opener. Uh, it changed our whole farm and how we farm. Uh, it was a great advantage to us to, to get information from chefs and end users about what they really wanted. And, and not listening to buyers who just wanted simple two things on an inventory item. And they weren't really looking at produce. It was just an inventory sheet. And um, just talking to the chefs and people, getting feedback, gave us confidence in trying new things and experimenting. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. And it's really, it's why we're here today still farming. Um, Mayor Bloom, I'm curious to know, uh, from the city's point of view, what is the market? To the city. Oh, it's. Uh, I think it's really so many things. Uh, but may I start by saying I, I feel a little bit like uh, like Wayne and Garth from Wayne's World. I'm not, <laughs> I, I am not worthy to be to be to be with this group of people who truly are at the vanguard of a of a, of a movement that is changing the way we think about food and think about what is on the plate in front of us, whether we're in a restaurant or, or at home. Um, but I, I, the, the farmer's market movement and the farmer's markets in Santa Monica, I think have really helped to transform the city into what it is today. Uh, Robbie and I arrived in Santa Monica 30 years ago in 1981, so it was right at the beginning that uh, uh, the, that we were here. So we've lived with the farmers markets and, and uh, like uh, Suzanne, uh, uh, when I grew up, I, I went to Fairfax High and, and, and uh, before that grew up in the San Gabriel Valley, my mom would take us in to shop 
at the, the butcher shop and because my folks were kosher so we had a a, a, a focus on food in, in the household and we would come in and buy bread on Sunday and freshly baked bread and and uh, and go to the butcher shop and go buy vegetables uh, back in time my paternal grandfather was a fruit peddler and my maternal grandfather owned a grocery store that was also a deli. So somehow it was imbued in me. Getting here to Santa Monica uh, and, and having the farmer's markets locally was just very natural for Robbie and I, and, and we're out uh, every Saturday and frequently on Sundays, and when I can make it, uh, I, I'm down at the Wednesday farmer's market picking up a few things. But uh, for the city, the farmer's market is a place to socialize. It's a place to meet your neighbors that you wouldn't otherwise have. It's a, it's a, it's a gathering place. Um, you know, we all think about the, the great weather in Santa Monica. Well, it's very conducive to shopping outdoors, so mm -hmm. it works really well. But in, in thinking about the, this, this program today, one of the things that we don't commonly think about at the farmer's market is that it, it's also a place of trust. We go to the farmer's market because we trust the farmers. We know the source of the food. We trust that it's going to be fresh, that it's going to taste good. We'll try something new. And it goes even deeper than that because where in society today can you go anywhere and across the table have somebody say, well, that'll be $3. And if you know, or that's three seventy-five. But if you want, we'll make it four bucks and grab an extra peach on your way out. <laughs> I mean, and, and then you, you know, you are trusted to hand over the right amount of cash. If, you know, in the in the bedlam, I think it's hardly counted. Uh, there is just an amazing bond that exists at the farmers market between the the people who are shopping and between the merchants and the farmers. And, 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 uh, and amongst everyone. So it has become a fixture in the city and it serves not just those who live here, but people c come from all around. Uh, the Wednesday Farmers Market attracts an international crowd. The business community, I used to have an office in downtown Santa Monica, uh, very close to the Farmers Market, and I was there practically every Wednesday. Uh, you know. Hundreds of people, well, you know, hundreds of people in suits come out. To I'm sorry, I'm laughing something. because I think all the chefs know that you've you got to get your marketing done because at noon, all the suits are going to fill the street and it's going to be completely clogged. <laughs> Let me and then it's a fist fight. You're just, oh, Let me loosen my tie here. <laughs> so I, th I think that, uh, um, that central marketplace, the gathering place that it is in, in a city like Santa Monica where people can walk or drive a short distance to get to a farmer's market um, at several locations at several uh, days during the week has really helped to make us, uh, it really enormously helped to make us the community that we are. Mm -hmm. I think it's given a great um, a boost. I call it PR if you will, but I think it's given a great boost to Santa Monica because the farmer's market in Santa Monica has become nationally known and Absolutely. nationally famous because I've been to a lot of different farmer's market and believe market, as we all have, New York, San Francisco, everywhere, and there is nowhere Chicago. in the country. I haven't been to Chicago, but I believe you. <laughs> there is nowhere in the country that we that there is the variety, the quality, the breadth, and the depth of produce that there is in Santa Monica on Wednesdays. Saturdays, yes, also I'll give you Saturdays, but Wednesdays, my that's my my deal. Um, and you know, I lived in New York for a year, and I seriously considered opening a restaurant there but it finally came down to I couldn't stand the produce. Mm. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, I, Don't leave. the tomatoes in February were just on. Well, you know, Mark, if you do, like we're invited to do dinners all over the country, you know. We bring our own tomatoes. We take, we're on the plane with our own, so people look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. I, mean, I have to take enough cooks with me, to, like I, I figure out how many boxes stuff I have to take, and then I have to take that number of people so they can carry that many things like, on their Okay, like, okay, yeah. I can top that. If our, our children do not live in, in California any, anymore, and so it's my mom, what are you going to be bringing us from the right. farmer's market when you come? Don't tell, don't, you know, don't tell that we, are taking things out of the state, but we're not bringing anything back in. <laughs> but 
It is, you become completely, <clears throat> completely spoiled, whether it is how you were raised in your family to know what it really is supposed to taste like or to how it defines your work. Mm -hmm. You can't produce what you produce without, without your palate. Mm -hmm. for, for me, it's also such a big part. Yeah, I love that so many of us are natives here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Native Los Angeles, it's extraordinary, actually. <laughs> it really is. To have this are you? number yeah. of Native Los Angeles. Yeah. 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 Ye
when we first started the salad bar program, the school said, well, we can't buy grapes because of United Farm Workers. And we said, well, our farmers, so I said to the farmer, Jack Balderrama, I said, who picks your grapes? He goes, me. And then when we get really busy, my neighbor comes over and helps us. You know, we don't hire UFW, we don't hire farm life. What is that, you know? And, um, but now we, we got our grapes in the school district because we proved that we weren't, you know, farm worker you know, abusers. But it, it, there's so much going on, and Santa Monica is, we're so supportive, supported, but you always have to be looking out. And now this whole GAP certification, and farmers have to be GAP certified, and you have to have What does insurance. that mean? GAP is gen a good agricultural practices. And a lot of the produce companies, they will not buy from a farmer unless they have a GAP plant. Well, what is a GAP plant? You know, it's just your general food safety. And Alex, you've said mm -hmm. this. You said the gap, it sounds very scary. You go, hey, I, I do that anyway. You right. know, we wash our hands. We've got a restroom out there. You know, we change the soap or whatever. But do you and have to pay to be certified? Yes. Uh, it, it's do you, you may well do all those things, but it's just documenting everything. And it's just, everything has to be documented. It's, it's, a, it's another layer of burden. So it's yeah. like but a you know, you, It's like a HACCP plan. You can't HACCP. have one set of rules for big ag and one set of rules for your friends. Well, we fought on that. That doesn't that work. Food Safety Modernization so. Act. There was an amendment to try to exempt farmers that made less than five hundred thousand dollars. Some of our farmers make more than five. So their big ag is really, really big. Little farmers are, you know, three million dollar a year. That's small. We just have to make that distinction. And, you know, but then you have, farmers then you, don't you, you raise unhealthy very easily food. get around those rules. So I, I firmly believe you can't have one set of rules for your people, your friends, and one set of rules for people you don't know. Well, I think it's, I think it's a because question you of scale. could very easily, you know, big ag supposedly could very easily get around it. You just set up, you know, instead of one right. big corporation, yeah. you just like they set up. You set up ten corporations, yeah. and they're all below the rules. And boom, there you go. Yeah, well, that would be very to easy to do. To, so to you have to have the same set of rules, the same set of standards. I actually truly do believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, we have and never had about one the, case of salmonella ever come back to the farmer's great. market because this stuff is not mishandled. It's not harvested off the ground. It's picked, and the farmers have pride and. And so it's, it's you know, unfortunately, safer. you can't legislate pride. No, but you. Well, we but, but maybe. Wait, wait, but let, maybe. Let's, let's not. We're devolving into a debate, and this is an oh, evening sorry. of celebration. <laughs> uh, darn. I, I believe debate will no, follow. I think, okay. I think debate will follow in the next few what days. Is the five, what is the okay. five-year plan? I'm going to tie it up with market. a bow, and uh, I'm going to tie this little conversation up with a bow, and come back to celebrating the market. How about if the market? How about if what? the Santa Monica Farmers Market has done, helps raise the bar and leads the way as to what Big Ag might do to change as opposed to the other way around. There well, you go. Well, I think that's one of the things that Santa Monica does best, actually. I we do, are, I agree. Uh, the, the, you know, look, we're just a little town of 90,000 people. Uh, we do get a lot of visitors, but uh, you know, when, when you look at us amongst the 88 cities in Los Angeles County and the the uh, 24 million people, I think, in, in, in the state of California, the country and the world, we're just a small speck. But what we do really good, really well, is to serve as a petri dish, uh, mm -hmm. a, as a place where, where innovation, and the farmer's market movement is an innovation par excellence, mm -hmm. um, where those things can be tried out and, and thrive, and then they spread elsewhere when, when other communities see that there's something good and something that something that's working and bringing about a, a, a better world and that is precisely what happened with the farmers market mm -hmm. uh, you know we were not the only farmers market in the world but we were one of the most visible and it really has taken off it's just it's incredible how far it's taken mm -hmm. off well uh, santa monica is more than just a little town of ninety thousand people i mean santa monica is a town that's known throughout the world it's been, it's a great town it gets a lot of media attention, and the fact that your success with the farmer's market, I think, has bred a whole lot of imitators. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. Because that's, I think, the greatest influence. Well, I, I, can I add something to Yes, but then yeah. we, we're going to have to start wrapping up soon, so oh, I okay. wanted to ask what? one last mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to say that, that um, you know, through its sort of size and longevity, I mean, it's taken 30 years of sort of this a uh, weekly gathering of, of people, a forum for learning and so on, that the market has indeed become like a, um, it's become, be able to, to become a big voice and to lead the way. And I think as we go into the future, that's one of the most important things that I hope the market 
can continue to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Santa Monica Farmers Market is See very lucky to, to live in the city of Santa Monica. Mm. <laughs> it can be challenging outside <laughs> the city of Santa Monica. Governmental support is very important for things like this. Yes, very important. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, I, I think that was a compliment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That was, a, that was a telling glance. Just to, well, to, to be fair, we have, uh, you know, we have a $525 million budget in Santa Monica. We, we spend a good deal of time preparing the budget and going through everything. But the, the farmer's market is run so well, uh, it goes through the, you know, we just don't pay any attention to it when it, when it comes to approval time. Uh, so, so this is something that Laura and her staff ought to be congratulated for. The far- markets that are not run well and that have problems and that are not uh, models for the communities that they're in and the, and, and the communities beyond. So, so I, I think it really is important, but I, I, I think that there is a lot of political will here uh, and an understanding in the community that this is, is the, uh, just the kind of the tip of the spear on, su- on su- sustainability issues. And, and, mm-hmm. and if Santa Monica stands for anything, it's, it, it, it's for sustainability and, and, uh, uh, and, and then some. Mm-hmm. But uh, so, I, so I just, I think that it really is uh, important for our community to, to, to buy into that. But I think what, uh, to come back to my earlier point, what is much more important is the fact that other communities can see something that works in it and adopt it. Because when something only happens on a small scale, it's really great for the people who enjoy it locally. But when things grow and it becomes a movement, like in Alice's Restaurant, you know, when, um, you know that uh, uh, this has become the Alice's Restaurant movement, um, that's, that's when things really start to change on a grand scale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's, um, there's another panel starting at 8.30, so we have just a little bit of time to switch over, but I just want everybody to give a shout out now for their favorite um, fruit or produce at the Santa Monica Farmer's Market and what you would do with it briefly, not a recipe, just a title. I'll start. <laughs> Winrose Farms Heirloom Apples mm. Pie. <laughs> discuss. Okay. No, discuss. No, no, no discussion. Oh, no, no, discussion. Just throw just as a you know a moment of inspiration. <laughs> Alex. Well, I'm not going to name one of my own crops. Well, you I'll, can't I'll, totally. I, Go for it, Alex. What's your favorite? What's your favorite she thing knows, that you grow? Yeah, right now. What? what I love would Romanesco you? cauliflower. That was. So oh, that that's good. Uh, <laughs> or, okay, I'm going to have a new one for next. <laughs> okay, Roman Romanesco cauliflower, but uh, sun, sun chokes. Are, are, which are, is, which which is, is are fun to grow. because of people who are, I know somebody who went to Caltech and saw this and went, like, it's, it's, there's some mathematical... Mm-hmm. Fibonacci. Pro- Fibonacci. Yeah, on the Fibonacci. 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 Fibonacci series. Fractal. Fractal. Describes Fractal. The fractals. Fractal. It describes the way it um, grows. It's and, and what's your favorite way to eat it? The sunchokes or the Romanesco? The Romanesco. Uh, just, just roasted with mm. olive oil, salt and pepper. <laughs> Amelia? Without a doubt... Alex Weiser's, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? No. Oh, yes, okay, I do. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, um, the, little, the little squashes. Sca- the scallop squashes. The scallop squashes. Nobody, I don't understand, but nobody grows them like he does. Um, and I just cut them in half and roast them cut side down, and they get caramelized in custardy and nobody else has them. I mm. don't understand it and it is the definition of what this hum- a humble vegetable that just sings. Mm-hmm. Mark? It's a climate. Um, in the market now. It depends on, it depends on, the, uh, on the season but right, right now, now. Uh, Richard at Two Peas in a Pod oh, has the, 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 um, the mauve runner beans and if you look in the back and they're the ones that are the ugliest beans in the pod and you open up, and they're a beautiful, deep, kind of a purple, which unfortunately doesn't last when you cook it, but you just stew them um, very, very gently in a little bit of uh, chicken stock, olive oil, salt, pepper, and some garlic until they're tender. Done. Yeah. Oh, and a, with a pig trotter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get right on that. 
Uh, I would have to say Marianne Carpenter's uh, Cherry Tomatoes. The mix, but especially the little pur tiny purpley ones. Mm. And uh, mm. I love them in everything, salads and whatever, but I also, I guess my favorite thing is a little brown butter, cherry tomatoes cut in half. You get the brown butter pretty hot, toss those tomatoes in, salt, pepper, lemon, parsley, basil, and then over anything, like chicken, <laughs> fish. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna it. chime in here and say that on the chef demo, on Saturday, Sang Yoon and I are doing ours at 10.30, and I'm going to be making a tomato pie with those little oh, great. cherry tomatoes. Tomato so pie. delicious. Mm. Wow. Tomato pie. Lily's chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. If you haven't had the free-range meats and stuff at the market, world of difference, try it. It's great. And I feel compelled as the mayor of the city to say, I love it all. <laughs> <laughs> but Give everybody a hand. Here's a man headed for higher office. But I have a special place in my stomach for um, uh, the Friends Ranch Pixies. Mm -hmm. Oh, And um, Weiser Farms. Robbie, what's the name of the melon we've been buying for the last couple of weeks? Going the orange one. <laughs> oh, sugar queen or yeah. sugar, sugar queen? Sugar cube? Cavallon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, so good. Just fast. Yeah, Thank it's you. incredible. Uh, I, um, and uh, Bloom Farms uh, homegrown tomatoes. Mm. Mm. Ooh. There, there ain't nothing like <laughs> true, lo true love and homegrown tomatoes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So nice. So Thank nice. So nice. It's my nice evening. <laughs>
you know, develop uh, the harvest at the Arrow Theater after a series of films that was um, all all uh, summer long, every month. Um, yesterday at the market, Amelia Saltzman. Uh, this evening, what great art! Did you guys like that art? How about that? Out of a broom closet comes amazing art that uh, now we get to share with the world. Um, Tomorrow, we've got a food policy summit and trade show at Santa Monica College, sold out, over 350 people. Our exhibitor show sold out, you can't get in. We're really thrilled about that. Uh, tomorrow evening, Localicious at the Annenberg Community Beach House, 600 people on the ocean, 30 of LA's best chefs. I think there might be a few VIP tickets left, but it's gonna be a great night. And we're grateful for all the chefs who have done so much for this market who 10 of them are going to be doing cooking demos, including Suzanne Goyne, including Mark Peel, including Emil, uh, including uh, Evan Kleiman and others on Saturday uh, and Sunday, uh, where right here again at Santa, at Santa Monica High School, we've got um, a full day worth of workshops, food preservation workshops, grow your own workshops. We've got some of the leaders in the country and the LA area who are doing workshops uh, right here in Barnum Hall, uh, our Food for Thought speaker series. We hope you can join us. We hope you'll tell your friends. It's really gonna be remarkable, so thank you. Um, I also have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Will Allen, longtime friend. Uh, we used to hang out at the Green City Market together, oh, 10 years ago, and you know, it's a great market in Chicago. It's, it's not as old as the Santa Monica Farmer's Market. Certainly back then it wasn't as big. Now it's, it's, it's getting up there. And, you know, we'd be talking about it. It's like, boy, this movement has really taken off. And, you know, I had the pleasure of getting to know this guy who at the time was, you know, he's a farmer. And he, he runs a nonprofit growing power, which he was running back then. And, uh, but slowly but surely, you know, he built his, his programs of training farmers, of, you know, spreading this message of urban agriculture. And, you know, growing food in the cities is a good thing. We're cutting down our food miles. We're giving people access to food in communities that might not have access. And guess what? The rest of the world is caught up to the fact that this Will Allen guy is something. Um, a couple years ago, the MacArthur Foundation named him a genius. He got the F MacArthur Fellow Award. Bill Clinton brought him on as a, a, a fellow for the Clinton Global Initiative. Last year, Time Magazine said, you know, this guy is one of the most 100 influential people in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, let's bring out a big round of applause for Will Allen. Good evening. As you can see, uh, these things uh, never really work for me, so for some reason. Uh, but it's great to be here. Uh, by the way, congratulations uh, to the Santa Monica Farmers Market. Uh, uh, for me, it's a real example of what sustainability is all about, to be able to sustain a market, make it grow. Um, it is one of the most famous markets uh, around the country and around the world as I travel around the country, uh, you know, I always uh, go to farmer's markets and Santa Monica's farmer's market is, is one of the ones that people talk about. And it's really important for a city to have a, a landmark like the Santa Monica market. It brings in uh, thousands of people each year uh, as they come to visit uh, this part of the country. Uh, they come to the uh, market and it brings in, uh, uh, brings in uh, resources uh, to that city. So that's really an important thing to have. I know a lot of people don't think of that in terms of how many visitors come in, but that's very important. And I want to thank my good friend uh, Jim Slamo, I've known for quite a few years, and we've got to know each other. And uh, when he started this uh, familyfarm.org, uh, uh, we did the, started the conferences um, and workshops in Chicago, and it's really grown. and. 
uh, when he told me he was going to uh, bring it out here and uh, uh, make this a part of uh, this, this great conference that you're having, um, you know, I was thrilled to come. Um, you know, because every time I get a chance to talk about good food, um, I, it, it's really important to me to, to be able to do that. And I, I just want to give you a little bit of, I only have 15, this is the shortest keynote you'll ever hear. Uh, 15 minutes, Jim just told me I have 15 minutes, so. Uh, <laughs> that's right. I wanted to do a PowerPoint, but, you know, uh, not enough time. Next time. I've al also, I've been here before. I spoke at Santa Monica College a couple years ago. Uh, so I've been here before, and it's a great city, and hope to come again. I'm invited, but uh, I may just come to visit. Uh, but I just want to tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up uh, uh, right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I grew up on a small farm. My father was a sharecropper who, who dropped his plow and mule in the 30s and moved to the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, but for some reason, he wanted myself and my brothers uh, to learn about uh, where our food came from, and that's how I, so I've been farming since I could, could remember. Uh, and uh, got away from farming, um, I grew kind of tall, and I had a bunch of scholarship offers, about 100 scholarship offers to different colleges around the country in the late 60s. And I went to the University of Miami in Florida. Uh, so I got away. When I left the farm at 18, I said, never again will I do this hard work. So you should never say never, you know. Um, and then I uh, played professional basketball after that and wound up playing my last years in Belgium. Uh, and one of my uh, Belgian teammates had a, um, a family farm and I went out to help them one day and uh, all of a sudden I realized something was missing in my life and I had this strong desire uh, to grow food again, which I started growing in Belgium. And when I got back to the States, in the 70s, I wanted to farm. <clears throat> of course, it's difficult to uh, start a farm in the Midwest, a price of land and so forth, so I had to work off the farm. Um, and in 1993, I bought the last remaining farm in the city of Milwaukee uh, that uh, it has evolved into a national, international training center. We also operate uh, 19 other farms in the uh, southeast Wisconsin, Chicago, uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin area. So we farm about uh, 200 acres now, and we employ over 100, 100 people, about 70 of which are uh, full time. But I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, the food system. I don't have to tell you all about the food system and how our food system's broken. I don't want to don't have enough time to get into that and have discussions about that. But we know our food system is broken. We know there's more poverty in this country and more poverty around the world than ever before. And we know that a large segment of our population uh, don't have access to the kind of food that you all have coming from the Santa Monica farmer's market. So our work that we do is really about social justice. Uh, we do about 70 things around the uh, food system, uh, not only uh, growing food, but also um, uh, working with um, food policy and trying to get cities, uh, are not only in Milwaukee and Chicagoland, but also around the country to change some of, this poli some of the policies. And it's really refreshing to see that you have a mayor that um, kind of stays out of your way and lets you do your thing because that's what I think we need to get other mayors around the country to do. And every time I get a chance to speak to mayors, as I go into these cities, uh, I do. I just recently spoke to the mayor of Detroit. Detroit is a city that has 169 square miles of land. Half of that is vacant. They have no retail grocery stores in the city of Detroit. So most of the people are eating uh, from fast food uh, joints or they're eating from corner stores with very poor food. So food access, uh, good food access in our cities is lacking. Good food access in our small rural towns has gone away. As a matter of fact, I get just as many calls from small rural towns around America than I do from uh, inner city communities. 
So we have this terrible problem that we have to solve. We don't have a choice of solving this, this problem of lack of food access. Uh, recently, I was at the White House. I had an opportunity to work with First Lady Michelle Obama in her Let's Move campaign, and I talked to uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and she said that, she told me that the next wars will actually be fought over lack of food and water. And uh, she tells me that, she also told me that everybody blames America because we made the declaration many years ago that we would grow soybeans and corn fence row to fence row and we'd be able to feed the world, but that hasn't come to be. As a matter of fact, for the first time in March, the United Nations stated that the only way to end world hunger would be uh, developing local food systems. We know that. We've known that for a long time. And the good news uh, is that a lot of people are starting to, to jump on a bandwagon of a movement that's a that started as a grassroots movement and now uh, it's a revolution. As a matter of fact, today I would say more than 60% of the folks involved in food systems work, food security work, um, new farms are under 40 years of age. So that's the good news. And, and, and more, more people of color are getting involved. As a matter of fact, uh, when the uh, First Lady put the garden at the White House, it's estimated 10 million new people started to grow food for the first time or go back to growing food. Many minorities who said they would never grow food again. Many folks that came from uh, uh, Latin countries, immigrants, said that they wouldn't grow food, but now they're starting to grow food again. As I travel the country, I see uh, I see this changing. I see more young people. I see more of a diverse population getting involved in the food system. And we have to do it. We all have a responsibility because every city I go into, they have these plans, these 2020 plans or 2019 plans like they have in Cleveland to become green and sustainable. But as long as we have this situation with lack of food access, none of those cities and no city can ever call themselves a sustainable city because food is the most important thing in our lives. It's the most important thing. I don't see how anybody could uh, want to do anything in a city if they're hungry. Our kids aren't learning. We have a higher childhood obesity than ever before. We have more obesity in our history than ever before. And, and it's, a, it's a problem that's growing. As a matter of fact, as I stand here and, and you sit there tonight, we're still on the decline of losing farmers in this country. So we have to grow new farmers. And to do that, we're gonna have to, well, there are some tremendous challenges because most of our soil is contaminated in this country. So how can we grow good food in contaminated soil? So we have to grow new soil. One of the things that we do as an organization, this year we'll, we'll compost over 22 million pounds of food and carbon residue into compost. That's the only way we grow food. We do not grow food in the soil inside cities in Chicago, in Milwaukee. And we're train, training over 1,000 farmers this year uh, to be able to use some of these uh, sustainable practices, uh, growing food without chemicals, to uh, be able to give folks access because it's always been my, my feeling and my thought and the thing that energizes me is to make sure that everybody has access to the same food. We shouldn't have different categories of food because of your economic situation. <clears throat> so I wish I had uh, more time um, uh, to talk to you about uh, the work that we do, uh, but I'll give you a, a little uh, a brief uh, uh, picture of what's happening uh, at our, in our organization and, the, and some of the work that some of our partners are doing. Uh, we need to have everybody at what I call the Good Food Revolution table. We can't anymore uh, leave out people. It's important to have the corporate companies, universities, uh, politicos, uh, educators, uh, folks that we probably wouldn't have had at the table 10 years ago. It's important to have them if we're going to make this work. It's important to have everybody at that table. 
Uh, we can't afford anymore to be so idealistic that we say we only want to work with these, this, these type of people or whatever. Uh, we have to have them at the table. Otherwise, we're just hurting the people we're trying to help. So it's really important for us to change the way that, uh, that we operate. And, and they're coming around. Uh, some of the things that are happening from some of the major corporations, for example, Walmart, which I know a lot of people, there's a lot of controversy with Walmart, but Walmart controls a great deal of the food that people eat, and we have to be able to get our local food into those local Walmart stores. We, we, we've been able to do that uh, by working with Walmart. We also have been able to work with Cisco. A lot of, a lot of people don't know, but Cisco delivers uh, most of the food into our, our school systems around the country. So they're the largest uh, uh, food wholesaler to get our fruits and vegetables into our school system. So we've been able to work with Cisco to get our food into the Milwaukee public school system. Some 90,000 students are now eating healthy local food. And it's important for us to engage uh, the politicos in your community to change some of the archaic uh, zoning uh, ordinances that we have. There is ordinances that actually prevent folks from composting or in certain areas for, e from, for even growing food. So we have to be able to change, change those uh, issues. And we need to get involved in the 2012 Farm Bill. The only way that Farm Bill is gonna, gonna change if, if the citizens of this country uh, get educated about what the Farm Bill is all about and to be able to um, have their voices um, at the table on the 2012 Farm Bill, because that's going to be the most important Farm Bill in our lifetime. So we need to get involved with that. You'll be hearing a lot of information going out uh, from the groups around the country uh, that are working on a sustainable, um, in the sustainable farm area. So thank you for the opportunity um, to be here. Um, and thank you, Jim Slama, and thank you uh, to the farm market here and Santa, citizens of Santa Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Uh, I'd like to bring up um, the rest of our panel for, uh, to discuss the future of good food. Um, I'll start with Father Greg Boyle, who uh, has been an advocate for at-risk and gang-involved youth in L.A. and around the world for 25 years, created Homeboy Industries as a nonprofit economic development enterprise, which now includes Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, uh, other home, Homegirl Cafe. Uh, he's also an author, uh, and his first book, uh, Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion, was named as one of the best books of 2010 by Publishers Weekly. Mm. Welcome. Uh, uh, Rick Namias is the founder and executive director of Food Forward, which uh, he founded with one tangerine tree and a volunteer recruited off of Craig's, Craigslist. Uh, they, uh, it's a totally volunteer, uh, or not totally volunteer, but um, They've generated things through social media. There's grown over 2,700 volunteers. And now Southern California's largest urban gleaning for the hungry organization, with over 2.2 million servings of fresh local produce being harvested and distributed free of charge to over 20 agencies uh, throughout Southern California. Uh, Michael Gorman has been a pioneering organic farmer for over 40 years. Uh, the last 20 years, he's been production manager for some of the large, nation's largest organic vegetable companies. Uh, and he's oversaw the production of over $20 million of organic produce in recent decades. Um, a few years ago, he said, you know, I really want to figure out how to get veterans into farming jobs. And uh, he created the Farmer Veteran Coalition to do just that. He's doing it. He was featured in the New York Times and is a real national leader now in, in bringing veterans uh, into farming positions. Michael, welcome. And last but not least is Evan Kleiman, uh, who did such a fabulous job moderating, moderating our previous panel. But you know what? Um, she is 
the, the, uh, um, the host of good food. How could we have a discussion about the future of good food without discussing it with... The, the, yes, we are. The, the, the host of Good Food, she's uh, the owner of Angeli Cafe. Uh, Girl power. Uh, we learn how to do these dances well. Uh, she's also the author of numerous cookbooks, including Cucina Fresca and Pasta Fresca. And uh, Evan, why don't we start with you? Since you do. I want to hear everybody else talk. No, because this, this is a discussion about good food. And I'm curious about what people think good food is and how it relates to their passion. Um, so what is good food and how does it relate to your passion? Well, what I think is really interesting is how the word or the phrase good food has now it's like a two-sided coin. There's good food, <laughs> which is what we all like to eat, and which is usually not connected to huge, large ideas. It's just people eating, often food that is very culturally based and provides a lot of joy and sustenance. Um, sometimes good food is just the food that's available because you're hungry and you want to sate yourself. But what intrigues me is how um, this movement for changing our food system has become known as the good food movement. Um, and so now you have this two-sided coin where sometimes food that can be very celebratory and that people love to eat and that we talk about a lot on my show, um, is not part of the good food agenda. And so to me, the, the, um, the sort of, the real challenge of the next period is to make all food good food in, on both sides of the coin. And that's gonna be quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. You know, the first time I heard the term good food was um, about six years ago, Farm Aid had their 20th anniversary in Chicago, and they uh, published a book, you know, the Farm Aid 20th anniversary book, and Jim Hightower, you know, former Texas Ag Commissioner and pundit, and, and uh, uh, thank you, Laura, um, author, um, talked about the emerging good food movement. And I'm like, wow, good mm -hmm. food movement. You know, at that time, I didn't know of Evan Kleiman. I didn't know about this radio show. Evan, when did the show start, and, and kind of what's the roots of the Good, good Food show on KCRW? Um, the show started in, I believe, there you go. I was going to say Thank 95, you, Sarah, Sarah Spitz. <laughs> and it started with uh, Mary Sue and Susan, who um, were the um, templates for the famous Shweddy Balls. <laughs> Um, segment on um, Saturday Night Live. Although I think that's very funny because Susan, there was no way Susan was ever that deadpan in her life. And um, I was an occasional guest on the show. And then I started in 1998. Great. Well, and it, so it's interesting that, yeah. that to me, um, Good Food on KCRW really unknowingly launched the Good Food movement because they actually claimed that term, and it's, it's a great term. Of course it's all about good food, but they did it, and I think Evan has done a tremendous job with the diversity of guests, with this emphasis on small farms, sustainable food, incredibly tasteful food, humane treatment of animals, all the things that we care about in our food system, I think you've done a great job with Evan, so congratulations. Thank you so many. Now, Will, Will Allen, um, you're the first person I heard say, you know, we need a good food revolution. What's a good food revolution to you, Will? Well, as I've traveled uh, around the country, I've seen this fever pitch of folks uh, that I think has reached that level. And I had this conversation with Michael Pollan uh, a couple years ago. And uh, we were doing a panel together, and I said, you know, Michael, um, I think uh, this is a revolution. 
And he says, well, I don't think it's quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And then I heard him speak uh, in Milwaukee, at UW-Milwaukee, about six months later, and he was calling it the Good Food Revolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So I don't know if I was the first one to start calling it the Good Food Revolution, but you've heard me say it uh, quite a few years ago. Um, but I, I see all these young people as I go and speak on college campuses all over the country, uh, whether it's Ivy League schools or smaller schools, uh, you know, the halls are filled, and these young people want to get involved, they want to be a part of, of this, uh, uh, this movement that, that I, I think is a revolution now. They want jobs. Uh, they don't want to go into the corporate world. As a matter of fact, uh, even schools like Yale, uh, they don't want to follow their parents. They've seen their parents involved in the corporate world and not being happy. And they understand about social justice because this is really about social justice uh, and food justice uh, to make sure that everybody has access to, to good food. And like I said before, uh, a great deal of our society, they, don't, they know what good food is, they just don't have access to it. And even the little ones, they know because anytime I ask young people, um, tell me about uh, good food, and they always uh, talk about the holidays, Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. uh, maybe Christmas, or other religious holidays, and they tell me about the food that they eat. So uh, I think we make a mistake by thinking that kids don't know what good food is. They just don't have an opportunity to eat it very often. So I think that's where we're at. We have to be able to grow the system, make it local so that we have, people have the full uh, uh, access to uh, nutrient, uh, full nutrient impact of food. Because if we ship food and we eat it 10 days later, we've lost 50% of its nutrient impact. Mm -hmm. And we're already growing in soil that's 50% less fertile than it was in 1950. So that's where we are in this country and that's what we have to change. And uh, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, but we need to give people a choice. When they go into a retail grocery store, they need to be able to see there's a, a local section that's labeled and they can make a choice whether they wanna buy from from the conventional kind of produce that's shipped in or they want to buy from uh, local producers and, and support those local farmers because I can, I know, I, I'm a farmer, I talk to farmers every day, we're losing our farmers, our rural farmers are under stress even though this big emphasis and a lot of talk is about urban agriculture, our, most of our food is still coming from those rural small farmers into our farmers markets. They're not, the food is not coming from uh, the cities yet from the urban areas. So we need to support those farmers, keep them in business, and grow that end as well. So I don't want us to forget about those rural farmers as this talk about urban agriculture, mm -hmm. which is important because I think to have a sustainable food system, we must have urban folks growing food wherever they can, and there's a lot of space. And if there's not a lot of space, uh, we can grow it vertically. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, building the first vertical farm in the world. Uh, within the next year and a half. So as an example of how that can be done and quantifying that uh, uh, bit of farming. So uh, I, I just don't want us to forget about our rural farmers. The farmers that you're working to train and we're working to train and uh, it's, it's for all farmers. But we need to have both sectors. Uh, uh, we need to increase the farmers in both sectors. Yep. Thank you, Will. So Laura, farmers markets for me, launched the good food movement because they gave farmers access to markets. And we used to have farmers markets and then they kind of went away when everything became wholesale and out of supermarkets and, you know, big, you know, conventional, everything else. But then the farmers market movement kind of reemerged and gave markets new access uh, to customers. And, you know, increasingly we got more and more farmers and more and more customers. And now people certain, have certain standards. Tell us, for you, you know, as a 29-year veteran of, of the farmer's market movement, um, you know, where do you see the farmer's market uh, movement going over the next 10 years? And how does that relate to the, the future of the good food movement? Well, I think, I think, you know, I, I, uh, the farmers markets have really brought farmers and consumers face to face for the very first time. 
you know, we have kids come and, and to, the, to the market for tours, and we ask them, when you go to the grocery store, have you ever seen a farmer in a grocery store? And they're like, no, you know, I never saw them. So it gets you thinking, you know, I, I don't know any farmers. And now we not only know farmers, you know, we go to their weddings, they go to our weddings, you know, they have, you know, we become friends. And so now we're personally invested in the farmer's well-being. And we go, oh, it's cold in Fresno. I wonder if, uh, if Harry Nicholas's peaches are going to freeze. Oh, no, what, how's Harry doing up there in Fresno? So I think it's really <laughs> given us a real sense of uh, we're all in this together. And John Tannarelli this year, he had this devastating freeze. April 9th, one of our peach farmers lost 95% of his crop in one night. And um, he can't do any markets. He's only picking just enough to come on Wednesday. And even that, he can't come every week. And he's just taking a total loss. And because he's direct marketing, he no longer was selling commercially. He was not eligible for crop insurance because he wasn't selling on the wholesale market. So he doesn't get any crop insurance. He gets no payout from the crop insurance either because he's chosen to direct market. So it's a crazy system. But, uh, but yeah, um, it's, it's certainly made a community out of all of us. And we all know. We're all in this together. We need good food. We need visionaries. We need leaders. We need everybody doing their share. We need to be aware. We need to really focus on that farm bill. And we all need to be smart. We all need to stay involved. Thanks, Laura. Um, Father Greg, tell us about Homeboy and particularly the food side of Homeboy. And, and uh, you know, what are you doing in terms of jobs and economic development? It's, it's a great story, and I think our audience would love to hear that. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I have this recurring nightmare that I'm on a good food panel in Santa Monica. Uh, though in the nightmare, I'm not wearing clothes. But uh, uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing here. I, I, I'm an expert on nothing. I work with gang members, so uh, so uh, but happy to be here. I love food. Uh, you make good food. Uh, yeah, and, and we're, we're in 24 different uh, farmers markets and so privileged that starting in October, we'll be in the Santa Monica uh, farmers market. <laughs> and uh, Homegirl Cafe will be there and, and they, uh, you know, we, it's not just farm to table, but it's uh, jail to farm to table. Uh, <laughs> Which I think is an important thing, and so uh, the, especially the young, the women at Homegirl Cafe, women with records and uh, rival gang members and waitresses with attitude, are uh, you know learning how to grow produce, and uh, and it's nice. And so, uh, but Homeboy Industries is a very extremely large uh, gang intervention program where uh, young men and women come from. Uh, all over the county, about 15,000 a year, mm -hmm. seeking uh, an, an ability to redefine themselves in the world and leave behind gang violence and, uh, and roll up their sleeves and bake bread and sell in 25 farmers markets or serve really gourmet, uh, uh, healthy food at Home Girl Cafe under the guidance of a genius, uh, Patty Sarate. So um, food is, is uh, you know, quite foreign to, to the homies and the homegirls, and so uh, much less farming. And to have them uh, have that experience of, of attending the soil and watching things grow and, and then seeing it you know, end up on the table at, at Homegirl Cafe, it's, it's really gratifying uh, on just about every level. So uh, anyway, I'm very privileged to Santa Monica to wel for welcoming that the homegirls come uh, October. Thank you. So Rick, um, a key element for me in the good food movement is giving people access to good food. And you've done it in an amazing way. Can you share a little bit of your story and, and how you see that food access growing? Sure. Uh, I first want to apologize. I didn't know that I'd have this backdrop when I put on this shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you going into seizure, uh, <laughs> I apologize. Um, I first want to actually say how humbled I am as someone who's really new to this movement, to a little over two years, to have had the amazing good luck and welcoming of the LA food community, from the media, to um, the leaders who have mentored us, to the funders, to the volunteers who show up week after week. Um, I didn't set out to start a nonprofit. 
it just kind of happened. Um, and it's happened at a time when one in eight Angelinos don't know where their next meal's coming from. And what we do is we're kind of agents in the middle of this. Um, as many of you who are native here know when you drive down the street, you see lemon trees, grapefruit trees, orange trees, year-round bearing fruit that goes to waste. And what Food Forward does is we send out cores of volunteers, three people in some cases, 300 people as of last weekend at CSUN. And we harvest that food and 100% goes to those in need. And now it's 20 agencies that we're working with. Mm. And um, to me, it's an effort that was born out of understanding the cruel irony of farm labor as a documentary photographer who worked on California farm worker issues and knowing that the people who feed us this amazing stuff every week um, can often not feed themselves is to me criminal. And the anger that came through that and came through the Bush years and all the twisting and turning of the haves and have nots and saying who can eat and who can't made me realize that we have these insanely giving resources in our own backyards that I mean it's shameful that it goes to waste and it makes me angry just talking about it. So it was an effort born out of anger, born out of a love of food, and out of a commitment to social justice. And um, we basically want to see the abundance of Los Angeles or wherever we're working passed along. What's amazing is this is stuff that comes year in and year out with or without us here. This is not new trees, this is not new water. This is, <laughs> these are trees, last week and we were at CSUN, with 300 volunteers and about 400 orange trees that are about 80 years old that aren't even watered anymore. And they're still giving off what in that one six hour period was almost 20,000 pounds of fruit that was divided amongst three pantries. And it's just people come out, whether they're young, they're old, or somewhere in between, and it's a kind of a wake up call. I mean, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just st uh, stop by saying that, that we, we harvest food, we fight hunger, but we're also about building community. And um, it's something that I feel is an important equation. I think any discussion about good food or food justice needs to include all of those elements because we are so blessed with a 12-month cycle in California. This is really, you know, we provide over 50% of the nation's produce in the state. And in Los Angeles and Southern California itself, there is so much already given to us, and to not pass it along feels just wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Rick, I think the, uh, the only things losing out on your equation are the squirrels who otherwise might be eating that food. What can we say? <laughs> Roast squirrel with a really nice orange sauce, you know. Goes to the <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Michael, um, you've been a pioneer in this movement for a long time, and Michael really helped launch the organic food movement to scale by helping companies like Earthbound Farms and others develop production systems that could now feed, that can now feed millions and millions of people. Um, how does your background there and your work with the veterans, how does this all kind of jive together in advancing this good food movement? The, um, for one thing, um, I went into food production with a high school education and a, and a love of the actual work of it. And one thing I like about tonight and starting with the Work Progress uh, Administration um, paintings. Can everybody hear me all right? Am I close enough? Is work is the other half of this coin about food, and it's just as beautiful and just as important as the food part of it. And that the and I think it's real important because I think that our country, this unemployment and this lack of employment and this this direction, this lostness in our culture today, has a lot to do with you know that that belief that we no longer, uh, that work was no longer important to our culture and to our Americanness and our, to our humanity. And I think that, so the, the part of farming I came from, Jim left a zero off, it's actually, I actually grew $200 million of, mm. of organic produce. And to give a sense of that scale, it would be that, um, 
in my 20-year career as farm manager uh, for organic companies, we sent out uh, at least three full semi-loads of fresh produce a day, mm. six days a week for 20 years. Wow. And so you've all eaten it. It's all over the place. Um, those companies still exist. In that 20-year period, I could probably count on my hands the amount of times I spoke English in a field. And I'm talking about having converted 10 square miles of land in California and Arizona and parts of Mexico into organic production, which no longer, all, those, all that food and all that land was, no longer had any um, uh, pesticides, no longer any uh, conventional fertilizer, no genetically modified seed put on it. It was all changed to organic. But everybody that worked there, everybody that worked there spoke Spanish from one end of it to the other. And at this point in our history, 80% um, of the fruit and vegetables harvested in the United States are harvested by people without rights of citizenship. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that good food has to talk about the work and the belief in the work and the opportunity for people to, to, uh, to come back to farming and come back to agriculture and to the treatment of labor. And so I got involved in helping veterans, uh, mostly who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, this crazy idea of helping them get involved in agriculture because, because they're coming home and they're looking for something and they're looking for that sense of mission and that sense of purpose and, and the challenge to do something difficult and the attraction to do something outside and something that's both physically and mentally challenging. But I just see from having been in the, that scale of food movement and just knowing what's out there and the growth potential that uh, the opportunity of if we just need to we need to bring a lot of people into this on the, on the production side and then the food growing side. And so that's what's really amazing about what Will's doing and those hundreds if not into thousands of the thousand new farmers that he's training because that's what we, that's what we need. We need. We need boots on the ground in the field, you know, mm. in large numbers. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, yeah. You know, Will, Will and I have had the pleasure of not only, you know, working in Chicago, but uh, also we, you know, helped advise when we wrote the book Wholesale Success, which is prob probably now the most successful book in the country, uh, teaching farmers about selling into wholesale markets and, you know, giving them the resources from food safety to, you know, very specific knowledge about, you know, harvest techniques and, and temperatures to store the food and humidity levels and things like that. Um, Will, what's it going to take to get farmers, uh, small farmers, and mid-sized farmers to scale up to meet the demand for local food? Because the demand for local food far outstrips the supply. And quite honestly, it's probably about three, two to three percent of our of our food in America is organic or local. Maybe it's up to five now. And what about the other 95%? How are we going to move that in the direction where increasingly people want it? Uh, in some cases, the price is too high. Yeah, certainly for you know people without access and without a supermarket, you know they're not going to pay double for organic food or even 20% more. How are we going to help scale up and and build this food system to the next level? Well, like like I think everybody said, we have to build the infrastructure to be able to do this. And building the infrastructure also uh, means that we have to uh, uh, transition some farmers and develop some skills to be able to grow more intensively. Uh, we can't, we're losing farmland as we sit here tonight, all over the world. We're losing farmland, uh, if not to uh, sprawl, to uh, just conventional means of farming, even uh, in Africa, as China is moving into Africa and South America, of course, uh, but the other um, thing that we have to do is uh, you're fortunate here in California that you can grow year-round. Even though I know you occasionally get hit with cold weather, um, one, of the one of the things that we uh, 
are doing in the Midwest and, and even in the South where they can't grow year-round is to uh, grow in high tunnels and season extension to be able to grow food year-round. That's the important piece that uh, we're working uh, on right now. Every day we're building uh, uh, greenhouses. Uh, schools are starting to uh, uh, put greenhouses back into schools and back into operation. Uh, so as we work with educators and uh, grants that we've got from the uh, National Education Association and from our local school boards uh, to be able to get healthy food into the schools so, and to train young people starting uh, from uh, uh, kindergarten all the way through uh, high school. Uh, so we, we need to attack it from all different levels, from transitioning these farmers that are not making money, that are uh, dependent on... Uh, uh, commodity payments to get them into sustainable production, but to be able to grow at uh, $5 plus a square foot. If you're able to grow at $5 uh, a square foot, uh, that equates to over $200,000 uh, an acre or higher. So uh, that's where we need to go. We need to uh, start growing more intensively. Right now, 50% of the fish that we eat is farm-raised. That's going to go to 75% because of what's happened in Japan and in the Gulf. So there's a tremendous opportunity to be able to grow uh, fish inside our cities and vacant buildings, and that's starting to happen uh, through aquaponics and uh, uh, that we're teaching farmers to, to, to be able to grow, uh, to grow food. Many of our uh, ma and pa operations and greenhouses, especially in the Midwest, most of those uh, growers are going out of business. But those growers, at one point in their career, they started out growing vegetables. We need to get them back growing vegetables in those greenhouses instead of leaving, leaving the farming industry. So uh, we're working with uh, folks like Carlin, uh, which is a greenhouse supplier. It's affected their business. So they're trying to get those farmers to come to our workshops to get back into uh, vegetable production in the wintertime. Uh, we just had our first frost last night. Uh, you probably heard about it. So things like that just wipes out uh, really hundreds of thousand dollars worth of produce, and we're going to have another frost tonight. Uh, then it'll go back. We'll go back into the 80s again <laughs> for a few weeks. <laughs> but once the damage is done, it's done, and those farmers are done. So uh, we need to put up those high tunnels to extend the season and to be able to grow, and we need to grow soil because that's the big challenge. Because like I said before, our soil is contaminated. If you're going to uh, um, you were just talking about uh, uh, transitioning the soil from conventional to organic. We need to, we need to grow soil. We can't dig down in cities because uh, you're digging, uh, bringing up even more contaminants if you're digging down. So we need to uh, grow food in new soil. We grow everything by adding two, two feet of new compost, uh, high uh, fertile compost and uh, using worms and worm castings uh, in our operation. So uh, we're able to grow intensively at that $5 uh, plus a square foot of production. So those are some of the things we have to do. We have to uh, use renewable energy. We have a lot of renewable energy systems at, at Growing Power. Uh, we have solar, we have anaerobic digestion. We're heating 70% of our water with solar in the fall, uh, summer, and spring. Uh, so we have to, to cut the uh, cost of production. What, what the cost of food is about is the cost of a farmer's production. So to, if a farmer is able to grow their own inputs, because the cost of fertilizer is tremendous because it's linked to, to fossil fuels. If we're able to grow our own inputs, if we're able to grow food sustainably, uh, if we're able to uh, 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 have a local folks work and we can grow, I believe we can grow thousands of jobs if we are able to grow, get our food back the way it was in the 20s and 30s and 40s. We weren't shipping food from all over the place. The food in Michigan and, and Illinois and Wisconsin, that food, 85% of that food was grown in those states. Now it's the reverse. And less than 1% of the food in Milwaukee is locally grown. So that's where we are right now. And that's where we have to change. Got a long way to go, but thanks, wow. Will. So, Father Greg, you're changing people's lives. You're creating jobs. You're creating great food. What's it going to take to get more companies like Homeboy 
out there to keep doing a lot more of that on a local level and you know really repair and help people change their lives at, a, at, a, a, at the level that you're doing. Well, something that's been mentioned here is a, a, a sense of community that we are in this together, you know, and uh, so you are always wanting to imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. And so, especially in this city uh, that has, in this county that has 1,100 gangs and 86,000 gang members, just, that's just the thing I know uh, is gangs is that you, you want to be able to include everybody in, in uh, the promise of a future and a gainful employment and a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gangbang the night before. And so uh, I, I'm heartened because things have changed. You know, you, you talk about a movement that takes time. And, and when Homeboy Industries began, you know, it was nobody cared, and people certainly demonized this, this population, mm -hmm. demonized me for helping this population. So, you know, we first 10 years of Homeboy was really bomb threats, death threats, and hate mail. Mm -hmm. And that's not true now. You know, now we're in the Santa Monica farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's heartening. I think we should, you know, progress and revolutions and movements are incremental. You know, little by little, people start to uh, celebrate a sense of kinship with each other. Uh, and then the east side comes to Santa Monica, and then there's a mutuality, you know. Uh, Santa Monica goes to Homegirl Cafe, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's as it should be. So the, the more that we can see that we're in this uh, together, that all hands on deck, everybody rolls up their sleeves, and people work together, um, you know, the healthier we are as a community and as a place in which for kids to, to uh, grow, especially kids for whom hope is foreign, and, and you want that to be uh, something that's offered to everybody universally. So people need to support and give money, you know, uh, you know our, our businesses and our, our bread and our uh, uh, salsas and chips and things like that. Uh, bring in about 36% of what we need every year to, you know, offer these services. And so more people kind of contribute or more people um, buy product or go out of their way in an intentionality to, to um, acknowledge that, you know, poor people are growing food and they're selling it and, it's, uh, and it helps change lives, not just bring good food to your table. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Rick, I've, um, I've read that over 20% of the food produced in America is wasted, thrown out. I think it's, it's actually over 40. 40? 40? 40, 42% of what we produce, whether it's in the ground or in a kitchen, is thrown away. So as a master gleaner, how do we change that? Master gleaner, it's a new program we need a certification. <laughs> We have our food preservers, our gardeners, and okay, no. Um, how do we change that? I think it's a, it's a mentality shift, first of all. I think it's all of us owning the fact that we have these, these resources, these living organisms in our homes as ornaments. And, uh, you know, I actually will make an appeal to the west side of L.A. because we've expanded Food Forward from the valley, which is incredibly robust. We have a 20 or 30 property waiting list now of properties we can't get to, but we have a waiting core of volunteers on the west side awaiting trees. So it's about people seeing, the, whether it's their trees or their neighbors or their family having a little piece of property up in Malibu, wherever the, wherever the fruit is, we will come to it. But I think it's all of us understanding something as simple as what's in our backyard but also what's on our plate. I mean, I, I, this is probably a buzz kill for everyone, but I so see my meals in a restaurant differently now since I'm doing what I'm doing. The overabundance of what we're given and throw away. I, I probably share more meals now than I do eat alone. I'm sorry, Evan, and, and all the ra restaurateurs who do amazing things. I just find our um, sense of quantity over quality in so much of our lives, especially as it relates to food, is so out of whack. If we all just kind of said, well, what, what do I need and what I don't need, pass along. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a really simple thing. It's really, it's a very human thing, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. Michael, can you share with us a story of a veteran whose life has changed through turning to farming? Um, about two weeks ago, oh, I did a three-week trip across the country in six states, and we had a couple of retreats and meetings, but I got to spend uh, <clears throat> two days in upstate New York, so uh, visiting three young men who all got injured and were all being recipients of our Bob Woodruff Farming Fellows, where we get to help um, combat disabled veterans get a launch in farming. So I'll run through this pretty quickly. But uh, the first young man um, was 28 and grew up on a dairy farm, and the dairy farm industry is struggling. He has a wife and three kids, and he did two combat tours, and he was uh, injured from the um, handling the spent uranium. He actually has a diagnosed brain disease besides his PTSD. But his parents can't afford to pay him to help on the dairy farm because of the upside-down dairy industry, the high price of grain. So uh, we bought him uh, four young registered Angus beef cattle and a young steer. And they, they, the, the young heifers were impregnated, and so he's got his own herd. He's over the roof. The next day, I went across the state, and I visited a young man who I thought at first he was in his middle 30s because the guy was so burly and beefy, and he talked in his deep voice and like, you know, and, uh, but he had lost his arm up to his shoulder, so there's nothing to put a prosthetic on, and he lost one leg on the same side of the body. And he has 20 acres. His wife's also a Marine. He wheeled his wheelchair outside, and he said, I got it easy. He said, he says, I got my whole brain. He says, I lost 49 of my boys, mm. and uh, 300 are injured. At least 20 of them can't talk. And she pointed back to his wife inside and said, she spent four years knocking on the doors of the, of the next of kin. He says, so he's got, they got 10 acres of maple trees, and he likes to go out every day all year in the winter in a, in a snowmobile, in the spring in a uh, four by four, and in the summer in his little tractor that John Deere converted the uh, controls from the right side to the left for him. And he's been tapping maple trees, so we, mm -hmm. we're buying him a uh, $7,000 evaporator so he can take this to a commercial level. Mm -hmm. But my best story, I drove an, uh, an hour, 30 minutes, 30 miles away, but it took me an hour and a half to find this farm. And um, this gentleman was in the New York National Guard. He got called up at 9-11 and spent eight weeks at ground zero doing um, uh, human remains excavation. And then he got sent to Iraq several times. And his last tour, he had his uh, skull blown off and reattached and spent a year and a half at Walter Reed, where the good people of our economic system um, uh, foreclosed on his home and his business. And uh, he bought this farm. He started working for a neighbor. He has a wife and three beautiful children. And uh, he talks very slow. I can't slow down talk enough, slow down enough to talk how slowly. It's, it's called a, it's, it's a cognitive processing issue. There's over close to 300,000 diagnosed cases of traumatic brain injury from this war. Mm. But there was this moment after dinner, after they treated me to the farm dinner, uh, in their home. They bought this abandoned Amish farm where some young Amish people were kicked out of the community because they didn't want to follow the rules about the only water in their, that community's homes had to be from year, had to be cold water from a year-round spring. And so they left and somebody else took it over and trashed the place and he got it for a fire sale. And so after dinner we went out to the barn with him and his three children. And they had a three-quarter cow that a neighbor gave him. And what a three-quarter cow is, a cow has four teats. And if one of them isn't fully functioning, um, usually, the th usually it's one of the back ones. And, and the other one next to it is usually a weak one. And so she doesn't work, she doesn't work well on a milking machine. So the neighbors gave him this cow. and. He was sitting on the stool with two of his kids. They had the Amish-made little wooden stools, and they were milking the cow. 
in the barn, and at one point, the cow stepped in the, in the bucket of the, that the young daughters was milking. And so they said, okay, that goes to the pigs. So the little boy came over, and he picked up the milk, and in the next stall was two little runt pigs. They had one runt, the neighbor was gonna throw away the runt because pigs usually have one or two more than the mother can maintain. And so he said, well, pigs are very social. You know, they gotta have other pigs to lie on. You know, a pig alone would, wouldn't even live. You know, you gotta, you gotta, so, so they give him two little pigs. So he poured the milk in there and then the father said, the, the injured veteran said, you know, we're gonna leave some milk because they had just been given this 12 day old, still had the umbilical cord, a little bull cow. And because it was a Guernsey cow and a milk cow, they didn't want the bull cow and so a neighbor gave them that cow. And so they'd been trying to get that cow together with the mother cow to see if she would adopt it and would start nursing it, but she's rejected it every night. And so they put it out to this pasture, uh, connect it to the barn. And I'm watching out through the barn, and I'm watching this family watch the cow, and at first she's kicking it, and then she, and then he, and then she let him start to nurse. And I was watching the healing of this family, and the mother taking to this bull cow and this barn full of rejected animals, and I thought, you know, don't want to offend anybody, but if there's a God, there was a God in that barn that day, and I just thought, you know, if that combination of work and food and bringing those things together, you know, there's, you know, we're a broken country and we're a broken people, but there's, we, can, we can heal a lot. Miss Good Food says we don't have to say anything else. It's 9.30. Laura Avery, congratulations on 30 years Thank of the you farmer's market. For making it all happen. Thank you know, and I also want to acknowledge the staff here at Santa Monica High, Kerry Upton and his team. Bravo! Thank what you. a beautiful facility. Thank you. We'll see you the rest of the weekend at the Good Food Festival.